here is a microfluidic chip that can sort cells. And this video showcases the entire process of making this microfluidic device. If you're wondering why we went through all the trouble to make this device, let me explain. So one day I was in class on Zoom and I was totally awake. And a Stanford researcher comes on our Zoom call and asks us, do you know how to sort cells by size? It would save me hundreds of thousands of dollars if you could. And I heard that and I woke up. She wanted us to build her the world's smallest cell sorter. So why does she need to sort cells so badly? Her research is in human longevity, and she realized smaller, younger cells have different genes than bigger, older cells. She needs to be able to separate them, see why they're different, and how we can come up with therapies. Table of contents. First, what are microfluidic devices? Are small, scalable devices that can be used to diagnose HIV, malaria, do huge lab processes on a small chip. And to the reason they're able to do this is because when you take fluids and you operate them on a micron scale, it changes the laws of physics that particles in that presence will experience. So a particle going through a microfluidic device will not experience inertia in the same way. It will not experience the forces of the real world, which allow us to do fascinating things. Currently, if you want to sort cells by size, there's a few ways you can do it. You could use a cell strainer, which is just like a strainer, except the issue is that if the holes of the strainer are a certain size, you can get big cells that clog those holes that prevent the small cells from filtering through. And the process often destroys a lot of the cells and reduces their viability. The second option is to sort by fax machine, but the nozzles on fax machines are usually about 100 microns, and the cells that we were trying to sort ranged from 40 microns to 200 microns, which could not be tolerated by these machines. And so we had to build our own device. So in this video, I'll explain to you how to build a tool that can be used in industry and sit back, relax, grab a cup of tea. We'll walk through lithography, the process of making things that are so small and manufacturing them and how to do this. Now we had to get started on making it and doing the preparation. When we begun, none of us had made microfluidic devices and we had no idea what we were doing. So we had to read the literature, that's step one. And when you're reading literature on a new subject and you search in PubMed, it always helps to check this little box called review articles, because those are introductory articles. And we found there's a few ways people make these microfluidic devices. One was called pinched flow filtration, and the second one was called cross flow filtration. Let's start with the first, pinched flow separation. How it works is you have all the cells going through a tube, and then you have an opening. And this opening, as soon as the cells go through it, bigger cells and little cells will diffract different amounts. So a little cell might like bend across the corner and then go up this way, whereas a larger cell would go straight. If you make a little catcher over here and you calculate the angle, you know all the little cells will end up over here. The second approach that we decided to use is called cross flow filtration. Put in the cells, another you put in a buffer. So you have the cells streaming and liquid is like pushing these cells to go upwards. And then over here you have pillars. So the liquid will push the cells upward. If the cells are small enough to pass through the pillars, they'll pass through the pillars and end up on the other side of the pillars where there can be a collection tube for cells that can make it through that. And if they can't go through the pillars, then the cells will go straight because they're too big. They'll go straight and they'll end up on the bottom side in the bottom catching container. So those were our two approaches. Now we had to manufacture them. And how do we do that? This I think is the most fascinating part because it draws on a lot of concepts that people use in making semiconductors and making anything that's small really. When you want to manufacture something that's really, really small, how do you do it? You can't use welding, you can't use injection molding. Introducing lithography. Lithography is a fascinating concept where you can manufacture things ex at extremely, extremely small dimensions. To do lithography, you go in a clean room. That means yellow lights because the light is filtered. It means putting on these clean room suits so no dust and hair gets in your particles. The first step towards manufacturing this was that we went into AutoCAD and we designed in CAD and then sent them to a mask printer in order to print these CAD files onto a lithography mask. You start off with a silicon wafer and you can put something on the silicon wafer called photoresist. Photoresist is this incredible compound that when exposed to light, it changes its chemical properties. And it's like, how do you put a uniform layer on something? Well, you usually call it spin coating where you put on the stuff and then it makes a blob and you spin it really fast and then the blob flattens into a uniform layer. So if you have a uniform layer of this compound on your wafer, and then from there, we shine light onto the photoresist. So if you have a mask and the mask only lets through some holes of light. So it's covered except for your design that's let through. The light will only go through where your design has left holes onto this mask. And then the light will shine where the holes are and it'll only change the chemical properties of the photoresist 
where you want them to be changed. So in those areas, the photoresist will harden and it will cross-link and change chemical structure. And the other areas that were not hit by light because they were covered by the mask will be soft and loosey-goosey. Then you're gonna take the wafer and you're gonna put it into something called a developer. And the developer will wash away all the areas that were not hit by light because the developer will react chemically with the areas that are still soft and it'll leave the areas that are cross-linked. And so what ends up happening is you're left with a wafer that now has nanometer level indents and structures that were caused because of this light changing the um, photoresist being washed away formula. And now you're like, Ananya, how dare you do me? We have a 2D structure here. How do we turn it into a 3D microfluidic chip? because a microfluidic chip, you have to inject cells into it, you have to put liquid into it. But right now we have a silicon wafer with some lumps on it. From here, we wanna use this gel called PDMS and pour the PDMS onto our silicon wafers. Then we put them in a vacuum chamber and the purpose of this was so the PDMS would remove all the air bubbles. So it'll just like solid PDMS blobs on this um, silicon wafer. Then we put it in an oven and the PDMS heated up and turned into a solid. When we took it out of the oven the next day, it was a, it was like a gel that was stuck on top of the silicon wafer. From there, we peeled it off the wafer. So now we have this gel that has a bunch of imprints on it. So like a bunch of like little indents where we wanted it to be from our wafer. Like they're to the nanometer level precision. And then we cut them up. So they look like tiny little chips rather than being many chips on one wafer glass slide, which serves as the bottom. We have our gel and we can punch some holes onto our microfluidic device. And these holes will serve as where we can plug in the inlet and outlet tubes because the inflow liquid will flow into the tubes, into the holes, through the microfluidic channels on the glass slide and then out through the output holes. And we bond them to a glass slide and we plasma bond them together so they will never, ever, ever divorce. And, and from there, we tested it out and we hooked up the, the microfluidic device with our tubes of cells and buffers and we saw what happened and did it work? No, it didn't work. Well, the first time we did it, it didn't work because of two main reasons. The first reason was for the cross flow filtration, the pillars were incorrectly spaced apart. And so cells of the incorrect sizes could fit through the pillars. The second issue was cells would get bit stuck to the bottom of the glass. They wouldn't flow through like we thought. They would just sit there and get stuck. And the third thing was that our pinched flow filtration device separation didn't really work out. And there was a lot of bubbles. Our microfluidic device said bubbles, which is bad. So what happened next? Well, we went back to the beginning of the process. We changed the distance of the filters. We realized you could add a buffer to microfluidic devices. So cells flow through without sticking to the bottom. And so we added this solution and we stopped worrying about the pinched flow separation and just did the cross flow filtration devices the second time with different filter lengths. We made new devices and it worked. And after we quantified how well it worked because we wanted to see, did it actually sort out cells of the right size? So we took out cells before filtering and after filtering, put them under a microscope and we saw that we did actually see our cells be separated. So then we gave it to Jing who had a great day and our project was complete. Huge shout out to Professor Fortis because it was her class that we took that taught us how to do all of this. And also my team, um, Ziad, Cassandra, Vincent, and Danielle, who were amazing. And I got to build this project with for Jing, our collaborator. Um, and I definitely uh, learned so much from the class that Polly taught us and also the team members because they were all very bright and they showed me the way. So huge shout out to them.